You're underground when it happens. The world above you tears itself apart. Cities go dark. Sirens fade. The grid dies like a circuit with no resistance. You're sealed in. Steel doors locked. Concrete thick enough to stop the blast. You've got food for months. Water for weeks. And a ventilation system you bought off a prepper forum. You feel safe. You're not. Three days in, the air tastes metallic. Five days in, you're breathing shallow, and your head pounds like someone's driving nails through your skull. By day seven, you realize the truth. Your bunker isn't a fortress. It's a tomb with a timer. Everyone dreams of the bunker, the ultimate escape pod, the fallback position when civilization collapses. But here's what the YouTube preppers don't tell you. Most people who seal themselves underground die from problems they never saw coming. Not from raiders, not from radiation, from physics, from chemistry, from the slow, silent suffocation of a system they didn't understand. This isn't about stockpiles or steel doors. This is about why your bunker won't save you and what actually kills you when you think you're safe. Let's audit the fantasy. In timeline 12a, they thought steel walls meant safety. They confused containment with survival, sealed themselves in like specimens in a jar, convinced that isolation would protect them. They had doors that could stop a tank and walls that could withstand a blast. What they didn't have was a plan for what happens when you lock yourself in a box with no reliable air exchange. Humans exhale carbon dioxide, about 200 milliliters per minute per person. In a sealed space, that CO2 doesn't vanish, it accumulates. When it hits 1% concentration, you get drowsy. At 3%, your breathing accelerates and decision-making collapses. At 5%, you pass out. At 8%, you're dead within an hour. Most amateur bunkers hit dangerous levels in under 72 hours with a family of four. Lesson. Walls don't breathe. You do. Plan accordingly. In Timeline 55X, they trusted filters more than airflow. They bought HEPA filters and carbon scrubbers, read reviews, compared specs. They thought filtration was the same as ventilation. It's not. Filtration removes particles and toxins. Ventilation removes the CO2 you're drowning in and brings in oxygen your cells actually need. A HEPA filter won't save you from hypercapnia. CO2 poisoning. You need air exchange. Fresh oxygen in, stale CO2 out. That requires powered systems, backup generators, fuel reserves, and redundancy plans. Most bunkers have none of that. They have a fan and a prayer. Lesson. Clean air isn't the same as breathable air. Chemistry doesn't negotiate. In Timeline 33D, they stored enough food to last years. They had freeze-dried meals, canned goods, rice by the pallet, calories for 500 days. What they didn't account for was moisture, mold, and microbial bloom. Underground spaces are humid. Condensation forms on walls. Water vapor accumulates. And in warm, damp, oxygen-rich environments, bacteria and fungi throw a party. Mold spores colonize food, fabric, even lung tissue. Black mold, Stachybotrys chartarum, produces mycotoxins that cause respiratory failure, immune suppression, and neurological damage. Sealed bunkers with poor ventilation become incubators. Your food rots. Your lungs rot with it. Lesson. You're not just storing supplies. You're managing an ecosystem. Lose control, and it manages you. In Timeline 61X, they believed generators solved the power problem. They had diesel generators, solar panels on the surface, battery banks in the basement. They thought energy was a technical problem with a technical solution. It is until you run out of fuel, maintenance parts, or breathable air to burn in combustion engines. Generators produce carbon monoxide, odorless, invisible, lethal. 400 parts per million, and you're unconscious in two hours. 1,600 parts per million, and you're dead in 15 minutes. Running a generator in an enclosed space without perfect ventilation is suicide with a runtime estimate. Lesson. Power doesn't matter if you die generating it. Physics enforces the fine print. In Timeline 78Z, they ignored what silence does to the mind. They thought isolation was peaceful, a break from noise, crowds, chaos. What they didn't understand is that the human brain needs sensory input to function. Deprive it long enough, 
and it starts manufacturing its own reality. Sensory deprivation triggers hallucinations, paranoia, anxiety, and dissociation. Time distortion sets in. You lose track of hours, then days. Sleep cycles collapse. Decision-making degrades. In extreme cases, prolonged isolation causes permanent cognitive damage. Soviet researchers tested this in the 1960s. Subjects isolated for 10 days showed symptoms mimicking schizophrenia. Your bunker isn't just underground. It's sensory solitary confinement. Lesson. You can survive the collapse. You might not survive the silence. In timeline 44R, they assumed medical supplies would last. They had antibiotics, painkillers, trauma kits. They thought first aid was about bandages and pills. What they forgot is that underground environments breed infection faster than surface wounds. Humidity accelerates bacterial growth. Poor ventilation traps pathogens. Stress suppresses immune function. A minor cut becomes cellulitis. Cellulitis becomes sepsis. Sepsis becomes death. All in 72 hours without IV antibiotics and proper sterile technique. Your medicine cabinet won't save you from microbiology running wild in a damp cave. Lesson. Infection doesn't care about your stockpile. Sterility does. Let's talk about what actually kills you underground. Humans need oxygen. Specifically, we need an atmospheric concentration of about 19.5% to 23.5% O2 to function normally. Below 19.5%, you enter hypoxia, oxygen deprivation. Your body compensates by increasing heart rate and respiration. Cognitive function declines. Coordination fails. At 15% oxygen, you lose consciousness. At 10%, you're dead in minutes. A sealed bunker consumes oxygen. Every breath pulls O2 from the air and replaces it with CO2. The math is brutal. An average adult consumes roughly 550 liters of oxygen per day. A bunker with 1,000 cubic feet of interior space, roughly 28,000 liters of air, starts at 21% oxygen. With four people sealed inside and no ventilation, you hit dangerous hypoxia levels in under 48 hours. Most amateur preppers don't calculate this. They seal the doors and assume the air will last. It won't. CO2 is heavier than air. It sinks. In poorly ventilated spaces, it pools at floor level, creating invisible dead zones. You won't smell it. You won't see it. You'll just get tired, lie down, and never wake up. This is how cave divers die, how miners suffocate, how people in sealed bunkers become statistics. CO2 poisoning is insidious. It mimics exhaustion. You think you're just tired. You think you need rest. You close your eyes. That's the mistake. Commercial bunkers use air scrubbers, devices that chemically bind CO2 and remove it from circulation. The most common systems use lithium hydroxide or soda lime. They work until they saturate. Once the chemical substrate is exhausted, the scrubber stops working. No warning light, no alarm, just rising CO2 and declining consciousness. You need backup systems. You need replacement cartridges. You need to understand the chemistry. Most people have none of this. Underground spaces are humid. Groundwater seeps through concrete. Condensation forms on metal surfaces. Every breath you exhale adds water vapor to the air. In a sealed environment, relative humidity climbs fast. Above 60% humidity, mold growth accelerates. Above 80%, you're living in a petri dish. Mold spores colonize surfaces, fabrics, and respiratory tracts. Aspergillus, penicillium, stachybotrys. These aren't just annoyances, they're pathogens. Inhaled spores trigger allergic reactions, asthma attacks, and invasive fungal infections in immunocompromised individuals. Mold also destroys your supplies. It consumes organic material, cardboard, cloth, leather, paper. Your emergency documents rot. Your clothing disintegrates. Your food becomes toxic. And the worst part? Once mold colonizes a space, it's nearly impossible to eliminate without industrial decontamination. You need dehumidifiers. You need airflow. You need to keep interior humidity below 50%. Most bunkers do none of this. Isolation is torture. This isn't metaphor, it's neuroscience. The human brain evolved for social interaction and environmental variability. Lock it in a static, silent environment and it rebels. 
Studies on solitary confinement show measurable brain damage after 15 days. The hippocampus shrinks. The prefrontal cortex atrophies. Emotional regulation collapses. Symptoms include hallucinations, time distortion, paranoia, and dissociation. Now add the stress of survival, the fear of what's happening above, the knowledge that leaving might kill you. Your cortisol levels spike and stay elevated. Chronic stress suppresses immune function, accelerates aging, and impairs decision-making. You become your own worst enemy. This is why solitary preppers fail. They survive the collapse. They don't survive themselves. Underground bunkers are breeding grounds for infection. Humidity, poor ventilation, and close quarters create ideal conditions for pathogen transmission. Respiratory infections spread fast. Skin infections fester. Gastrointestinal bugs cycle through the group. And without proper medical infrastructure, intravenous antibiotics, sterile surgical tools, diagnostic equipment, minor infections become fatal. Consider a simple scenario. Someone cuts their hand on a sharp edge. In a normal environment, you clean it, bandage it, monitor for infection. In a bunker, the wound is exposed to airborne bacteria, surface contaminants, and moisture. Cellulitis develops within 48 hours. Without oral antibiotics, it progresses to sepsis. Without four antibiotics, sepsis becomes septic shock. Death follows in 24 to 72 hours. Your first aid kit won't save you. You need hospital-grade supplies, training, and sterile protocols. Most preppers have none of this. So how do you survive underground? Engineer airflow, not just filtration. You need continuous air exchange. Intake vents high to pull in fresh air. Exhaust vents low to expel CO2. Powered ventilation with backup power and redundancy. Calculate your air needs. Assume 550 liters of O2 per person per day. For a family of four, you need at least 200 CFM of continuous airflow. Install CO2 monitors. If you're not monitoring CO2, you're guessing. Guessing gets you killed. Control humidity religiously. Keep interior humidity below 50%. Dehumidifiers, vapor barriers, airflow. Monitor humidity daily. If humidity climbs above 60%, increase dehumidification immediately. If you see condensation, you've already lost control. Design for redundancy. Single points of failure kill you. Every critical system needs backup. Assume everything will fail. Plan for it. The moment you rely on a single system, you're betting your life on a component that will eventually break. Store supplies in controlled conditions. Food needs to stay dry, cool, and sealed. Mylar bags, oxygen absorbers, climate control below 70 degrees Fahrenheit, humidity below 15%. Rotate and inspect quarterly. If you see mold, discard the entire batch. Establish psychological protocols. You need routines, structure, purpose. Without them, your mind unravels. Maintain schedules, physical activity, conversation, and mental engagement. Recognize signs of decline, irritability, insomnia, paranoia. Intervene early. Train for medical emergencies. You need intravenous antibiotics, suture kits, sterile technique, diagnostic skills. Take wilderness medicine or EMT training. When you're underground, you are the hospital. Plan your exit. The bunker is temporary. Know when to leave. If air degrades, supplies dwindle, or mental health collapses, evacuation is survival. The bunker is a shelter, not a prison. Let's talk about why people fail. Most preppers don't test their systems. They assume it'll work. Denial bias tells us bad things happen to others. Test everything. Break it before it breaks you. People overestimate resilience. They think they'll adapt to isolation. Most won't. Psychological resilience is a skill, not a trait. Optimism without testing is wishful thinking with a body count. When things go wrong, people panic. They follow confidence over competence. One person says the air is fine, and everyone believes them. CO2 climbs, no one questions it. Measure, don't guess. So here's the truth. Bunkers work if you engineer them correctly. If you understand the physics of airflow, the chemistry of CO2 scrubbing, the biology of infection, and the psychology of isolation. Most people don't. 
They seal themselves in and hope physics takes the day off. Physics doesn't negotiate. Your bunker isn't a fortress. It's a life support system. And like any system, it requires maintenance, redundancy, testing, and expertise. Without those, it's just a concrete coffin with a heavy door. The collapse won't kill you. Your ignorance will. You've got three options. One, build a bunker that actually works. Engineer it, test it, train for it. Two, accept that underground survival is harder than you think and prepare for surface strategies instead. Three, do nothing. Seal yourself in when the time comes. Hope the air lasts longer than your optimism. They hoped. You'll prepare. They trusted the walls. You'll trust the science. They died in the dark. You won't. Your move.